Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I I really, you know, I do really like that song. Uh, there is, there's a lot to it. You know, I know it's the 4th of July and we're celebrating our nation's uh, freedom from, you know, the, I'll put in quotation mark, the tyranny of England, you know, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is pretty cool about this country that because it's been this way for so long, I don't know that we really think about it too much, but uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of cities or whatever, they they had, um, you know, names, can I say like this, from the old country? <laughs> but what they did when they came to this to this country was they put the word new on it, you know? So like New York and New England and New Orleans, even though that's a French thing, you know, but it, it, it was encompassing all that. And the whole identity was about uh, freedom, you know, uh, liberation from that which was old to something that is new. And, you know, and I, I know that we could get into this whole thing about, you know, the Christian foundations and all that. And, and I firmly, you know, believe that and everything. Uh, but I really do believe if we use the verse in Romans where God says he uses, you know, visible things to understand invisible things or natural things to understand spiritual things that what God is really after in humanity is to move from the old man to the new man this is why we love the verse right if any man or anyone in mankind right is in Christ he is a new creation. So everything that God has desired is something new. Now, I don't know. I, I We probably do, and I've not really paid attention. I guess now I'm going to have to go look it up. I told you before I know that there was, I think, 18 cities in the United States called Zion. Um, I don't know. Are there any cities, Nathaniel, in the United States called Jerusalem? Maybe, yeah, I don't know. But the cool thing is, the reason I mentioned that, I've never, do you know, Corey? Yeah, I don't know either. Does anybody know? No, I don't know either. It's cool. It's, it's kind of cool. If there isn't any, you know, it kind of plays into what I want to say, but that doesn't, that doesn't really hold weight or anything. But uh, what the cool thing is, what Paul said in Galatians, he said that the new Jerusalem, which comes down from above, is the what? Mother of us all. And so God's after a new Jerusalem or, you know, a, a, a new dimension is what God is after. And, and I, really do, I really do love that aspect that we get to understand. We've come 200 plus years uh, in those aspects of, of a country for freedom but it never really changed the heart of a people to the way God wants it. All right? What do you mean by that? It's never returning to the old. It's becoming in fullness the new. This is what God is after in our lives. So, and, and you know, we've, we've been dealing with like, well, the, the, this, which the same thing, it's the same thing it's, uh, that it's always been if you go all the way back to the beginning of mankind as Adam, as God created Adam and then he, you know, he took Eve out of his side. The issue has been the same from the moment that Adam and Eve chose their own way and that is the condition of the heart. We can know a lot of stuff in Christ, and we should, and we 
should have wisdom and we should get wisdom and we should get knowledge and we should get understanding. But in all that we have in that, it won't help us a whole lot if it becomes a legal position. It will help you. It's like exercise, right? What did Paul say about exercise? It profits or it's meaningful just a little bit. In other words, like, you know, and people will, could argue that, oh, no, it's strong and everything, but it won't stop you from getting hit by a bus, you know. Will Jesus stop you from getting hit by a bus? He certainly can. You know, we've avoided a lot of situations in our lives, you know, that, wow, do you see what could have happened there? That person ran a red light and almost, you know what I'm saying? And, and, I, and someone could point to, well, you know, this happened, and I get that too. But God's after our hearts, 100%. And so we've been talking about that, and ever since, what, a couple of weeks ago, maybe, I don't know, when, or maybe it was last Sunday, and, and uh, you know, I, I said, God, what is it? What do we need to do? And he said, give me your heart, right? We, we looked that up in, in uh, the Proverbs. So and I've kind of been feeding off of that a little bit lately, because really, if nothing changes in my life, then I'll just continue in the path I'm going. But what God really wants to do is change our hearts. And not only does he want to change our hearts individually, he wants to change the whole heart of the church. The heart of the church. This is why, like when we sing the song, Till, until the church takes her place. So the new Jerusalem is fully expressed, fully exposed, you know, complete. There's no more, uh, you know, by the way, you have to change the words on that song. It's not the sweet of Adam. It's the sweat of Adam. <laughs> it's okay. I know you couldn't see it, but we could see it. We knew what you meant and if you knew the song, but um, it was just a typo. I'm good with it. Uh, but it's the sweat of Adam, right? until there's no more sweat of Adam, no more toil. That's why I love this when Jesus said this. He said, look, he said the Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. In other words, God didn't set up this day to put man in it. What God did was he made man and created a day for him. So that God could let man rest in him because God was the day or God is the day, right? And that man didn't need to try to meet all the rules and regulations that man would create. That he could be really free, liberated in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And it's, it is unfortunate to some degree, but it, it's necessary, right, to keep the carnal mind in check that the freedom isn't to do what we want. The freedom is to do what God wants. And it's not even the freedom to decide, well, you know, this is what God wants for my life. You know, it's really, it's really, you know, to keep that in check is, is what is God really after. So anyway, I know I'm rambling a little bit, but I would like to, uh, let's see, if you would, I, I don't know if you read your Proverbs for today, but you know, it's kind of funny. I, I read it again today and last month when I read this, you know, uh, it really jumped out at me. And if I went back and looked at my text, I think I sent all of you a little text about some of this in here. And it's interesting, like, because one of the things that really grabbed me was how many times in this chapter or the context in this chapter where he used the word heart. Now, I know this. You know this. This is not beyond us. This is just 
repeating through the whole course of our Christian lives that God is after the heart. The heart. Because he knows if he has our heart, he has everything. You won't need a law to know how much money you should give, how much time you should give, what you should give. If he ha- where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Right? You, you won't move from a position of right and wrong. And I know that can be dangerous in an hour where everybody does whatever they think is right in their own eyes. But you won't have to move from any of those positions. You'll be able to have freedom and liberty from the most holy place. Where God says, open your mouth and I will fill it. I'll put the words in there. This is what God's after. Amen? All right. So if you turn with me to, I'm going to start here. Turn with me to Proverbs. Proverbs, not chapter 4. You thought I was going to say chapter 4, but I'm not. Proverbs 25, verse 26. And I really have a lot of stuff to say today. I'm going to try and make my point, and then I'm going to just maybe, uh, you know, not do it all this morning. Somebody yesterday asked me at the picnic, which I thought was kind of funny because I chuckled, so has anybody ever said to you, you preach too long? (laughs) They literally said that to me. And I said, oh, yeah, I hear it all the time. And so, uh, (laughs) you know, I said, but it doesn't bother me if they say that. You know, so I just keep doing what I have to do. And I mean, geez, I, if we come to church, wait, maybe two and a half hours on Sunday and an hour and a half on Wednesdays, that gives us a five hour time slot to gather together in that aspect. You know, I don't really feel bad out of, I don't know how many hours there are in a week, but uh, you get my point. <laughs> it's not a big deal. I, I would prefer not to, to preach long. You, really, I, honest to God, like, hello, teachers, tell me if this is true. If your students really got it, you wouldn't need as much time, would you? <laughs> it would make your life much easier, wouldn't it? And really, that's what God, through the Holy Ghost, is really saying to all of us. If we would just get it from him, you know, but... And, and I do get it. I do get it that we're not going to get it all at once. We're not going to get it, you know, instantaneously every time. He might drop something in your heart today, and you may not get it for years. What's the most important thing? That it, we get it, right? That really is the most important. But I do believe this scripture, too. He said in the end days, and I don't, I don't want to make that a calendar time thing, But when he's starting to wrap things up, he says, I'll do a quick work. In other words, I'll make it alive to you. All right? So here we go. What are we talking about this morning primarily? The what? Heart. See, I was going to stay silent until somebody said it. And then, see, this is why it takes so long. (laughs) Sherry's giving me, like... (laughs) I couldn't hear you. I have to hear. I have to hear. Okay, so here we go. This is, this is pretty good. I like this. This kind of just like, you know, it's kind of weird to me that things like I've been reading like all my life and then all of a sudden now they just, it's like they have, I don't want to say new meanings and maybe they are new. It just, it has much greater clarity of what God's trying to get out of my life and our lives. Because really, God's not after a one-person show. What God's really after is a people. That when they go to work, go to school, you know, go wherever they go, that they don't have to be religious. They just have to be Christ. And one of the coolest things about God is he's after in our lives is just to be righteous after his standard. 
where someone could say, wow, that person's different. Okay, here we go. A righteous man, verse 26, Proverbs 25, verse 26, a righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Did you hear that? What kind of person? A righteous man. Falling down before who? The wicked. Now, I know a lot of times when we see that, we would start to think out there. But what God's really trying to get you and I to understand here is a wicked man right here between my ears. Or can I, let me rephrase it for you into a way we understand more. A carnal man, a natural man, Adam's way of thinking. Okay, because wicked, we, you know, you, in Adam, there's extremely good and extremely bad, right? And that kind of man, a righteous person, what do they do? They fall down. If they fall down before the wicked, they are like what? They're like a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. I, I love it. Now, in the Living Bible, it says, if a godly man compromises. See, what the, other, the, the King James says fall down, but this gives us an understanding of what it means to fall. The minute we compromise, compromise. A righteous person. We're talking about a new creation man. We got right, not because we did something other than repent, but we became right because of Jesus, right? So if the righteous man, the godly man, compromises with the carnal man, he is like, or they are like, a troubled fountain or how about this, a muddied spring or a polluted well, right? Polluted, uh, polluted pools that have turned dirty and muddy. Everybody understands this, right? You know, the, the contemporary says it like this. When a good person gives in to the wicked, it's like dumping garbage in a stream of clear water. So the minute we decide in our own minds that we are going to do something, even if it appears to be right, if it's contrary to God's doing, we've compromised to the carnal mind. Uh, all right. I know this is going to take a long time. Look, how many of you think that it was right for Jesus to go to the cross. Well, it certainly wasn't right from a human perspective. But it certainly was right from a father's perspective in what he was doing. And if they would have compromised because of the human perspective the father's perspective could have never been satisfied or fulfilled and sometimes we give in because the wicked man carnal man screams in our face like the three Hebrew children said we're not bowing down, even if we die. We're not doing what you want us to do. So when a righteous man falls down or compromises, right, or gives in to the carnal, they are like a polluted, troubled fountain, 
and a what? Corrupt? A corrupt spring. Okay? All right, I'm just going to... This is going to take me way longer than I wanted, so you're going to probably be here for like four hours today. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm going to try because I, I, I have something really good for us. I think, I think for the, you know, I really appreciated the Kathy Walker songs this morning because they were really exciting to me in the context of what God is doing in our lives with our hearts, Okay. So I'm just going to read this, and I don't. And it's kind of interesting, but like David, he was running from Saul, remember? But he came to the priest, and he ate. He got the five loaves of bread, and you know. But he kept running, didn't he? He kept running. He kept leaving, even though the king, in my opinion, right? David didn't lie. Never said he when he said the king gave put me on an assignment. I, I, I think that I know from a human perspective, it looked like, looks like he lied. But maybe from a God perspective, he was listening to another king. I mean a godly king. King Jehovah reigns from the most holy place. And sometimes God can make us do things. Oh my God, now I want to preach. But sometimes God can make us do righteous things according to God and not to man because it says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he will turn it like a river any way he decides. And sometimes you and I will make decisions, if our hearts are right towards God, that will seem not correct to everybody else. Well, you're opening up a door. Yeah, you really are. You really can. This is why the heart matters. It really does. Remember, and you, we need a litmus test in what I'm saying. The litmus test is between Saul and David right now, okay? What was the difference between Saul and David? All those Psalms. It wasn't who made mistakes. It was who had a heart toward God. David didn't write about how he did right and following the rules. What David wrote about was how much he loved God. How do you know that? Because we sing songs about that today. How many thousand years later that the Spirit of Christ in a New Testament reality Bubbles, or I'm going to get to this, like I'm, I'm letting this out. I, I, it springs up like a well. Spring up a well. Because the one that David was really running from was the carnal mind. The lawless one. The lawless one. See, this is one of the things that always troubled me when people said, well, I'm a red letter New Testament person and I'm not following the law because Jesus set me free. That all they were doing was expressing a path of lawlessness that is hidden in the carnal mind, in the heart of mankind. When God never did away with the law, the truth of the matter is the Old Testament law, he said it was righteous. What he did was he did away with how it was going to be expressed. Not by human effort. Well, I'm going to do what they tell me to do. No, by what God does in the heart of a person. How do you know that? He did away with the law of sin and death so that we could come alive by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There's only one rule for that. What is it? Those that are led by the spirit are the sons of God. You have to let God lead you. Okay. So the word troubled here, it means trampled, foul. And it literally has an idea that means it was fouled with dung or the old nature. 
right? And, you know, the fountain, okay, corrupt, ruined. It was destructive. It was perverted. It was marred, spoiled. And this is really interesting that it says it was good for nothing. Everybody say this with me. No matter how good Adam is, it's good for nothing. I mean, really think about, hey, Selah, Selah, yeah, right, Selah. Pause and think about that. No matter how good it is, it's good for nothing. It's good for nothing. This is pretty good stuff, I think. So it says, right, for a spring, it's a fountain that's opened by digging. Now, I have so many thoughts running through my head. God, help me settle down here just a little bit, Lord. Just a little bit. All right. Now, we've been talking about the heart, right? And the heart, right? The heart, the heart. It's the, it's the total, it's the totality, right? It's the totalness of man's inner or, you know, their invisible nature. This is what God is after. And I told you that God said, give me your heart, right? But in Proverbs 4.23 today, we read this again. You know, I I should probably, like, while we're here, I know I'm not going to get to where I want. Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me. In verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, here, children, the instruction of a father attend to his understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law or my word, right? For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. But listen to verse 4. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words. I love this, right? You know, I, I, I equate that to this now, right? Oh, that my words were written, that they were printed in a book. I will put my laws in your inward parts and I will write it in your heart. Retain them in your heart. Well, how do you do that? You let God write. My tongue is as the pen of a ready writer. Go ahead, say it, Danielle. Yeah, and then he says what? It's like his heart is what? Indicting a good matter. It expresses the good matter. This was David. This is what he understood. He, look, I, I, I'm a firm believer. Yeah? I can relate to David. I'm sure David did things he didn't think he'd ever do. But God let him travel down the path. And the reason God didn't throw him off to the side or replace him it's because his heart was toward God and his purpose. This is why I love to repeat this over and over and make you feel better. I hope there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, period. Now, if you have a problem the other way, that you're a little too proud and a little too arrogant, this is what the Bible says for you and I. It says, let no one think of themselves more highly than they ought to. Because a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. But he says, listen, he says, let thy heart retain my words and keep my commandments and live. And if I drop all the way down to verse 23, he says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life, right? Now, you know what the New King James says for 423? I love this. Now, well, what what happens if we cave into a carnal realm or an old nature? It says we are like a what? Corrupt fountain or a polluted spring, right? Yeah, I don't remember exactly now, but because my thought and my words, they all try to give the same meaning. But look at what verse 23 says here, and I'm going to read it out of the New King James, Okay. This is what it says. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. 
So what is he really trying to get you and I to understand? What is God trying to get you and I to really understand? That our heart is a fountain. Did you know this? Everybody knows this scripture. Jesus said, he'd give living waters, right? You drink living waters. And up out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. Right? We know the scripture. And so, like, I always translate that to me, you know, I didn't even really, to be honest, I just stumbled across this. But, you know, like, up out of your desire realm. And this connects. It it works, right? Up out of your desire realm shall flow the Spirit of God, the river of God, right? But if you actually do a study on that word, bellies, figuratively, it says it means the Heart. The heart. So everybody say this with me. My heart is a spring. And if I keep my heart diligently, what will spring out of it is the issues or the action of life. Now, now that I understand that my heart is a spring... And I understand that I'm righteous and I can't compromise before the wicked or my spring will become polluted and corrupted. Now, I am talking about this for you and I as an individual. I'm also talking about this as you and I as a church body, a family body here. But I'm also talking about this. This has greater implication about the whole church world. I don't care if you're from what we would say Catholicisms to kingdom. Can I say it like that? It's really, if you understand the, the, the 90 foot golden stature or the, the, the Nebuchadnezzar's statue, it's really just a picture of human religion from the bottom to the top. In other words, to those that know the least, to those that know the most. Okay? And I'm sure it has other implications. So we can't compromise. We can't give in. We can't cave in, right? We can't decide to do whatever we think is right because it's giving in to the wicked man. We, we, you can't be, uh, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, thus deceiving yourself. Is it, is, is it clear? Okay. So turn with me to James. Chapter 3, I believe it is. Now, I kind of made a little mistake the other night when I was saying that Jesus actually quoted this and and I could get real spiritual and technical and say, well, you know, every word is divinely breathed. So Jesus just said this through James. Now, I could find truth in that, but if you went looking for it, it, James actually said this, okay? Now, I did, Jesus did say this in a different way. He used fruit, and he didn't use a fountain. How's that? He used a tree. Does that make sense? A bush? Okay, here we go. I'm probably not clear. Verse 10. Chapter 3, James. You know, in the first part, you know, and he talks about the tongue and how the tongue can be poisonous. And we've been, it's, hard, it's you know, men can tame every animal there is, the whole works. I mean, this is literally what James wrote. But man has trouble what? Controlling his tongue. Anybody ever have that problem beside me? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't, I, I don't know, but like, I'm sure not just once in my life that, I said after, boy, I wish I wouldn't have said that. (laughs) Which is pretty good if you can finally get to the point where you learn to control your tongue, right? Because it is a fruit of the Spirit, self-control. But what really God is still after is that it can't even be in our hearts. Whatsoever a man thinks, right? He He can't think a certain way. 
Like, well, like I, I, I get this, and, you know, if you, like in the Old Testament, what, like, you know, seriously, I've said this so many times. I really believe that if New Testament Christians really could lay hold of this truth, it would really help them that the New Testament is actually harder than the Old Testament to follow. Because in the Old Testament, if you had to do the act. But in the New Testament, you just had to think about it. But the cool thing is, we have the Holy Ghost. We just can't reject him. We can't can't squelch him. We can't. And the easiest way to squelch him is compromise. And I don't want to make an excuse for us, right, in the sense, well, look, you, you know, you're going to make a mistake, and I, I get that. And, and it, but if your heart is true and it's pure and it's honest, God will actually use it for good to change your life to what he's after. I mean, we've never lived in this kind of, I, 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 I can't imagine... Saul of Tarsus, who was changed to Paul. I mean, in his own thoughts at times that he must have thought, God, you've forgiven me and I killed people. I literally killed people. We've never had that that depth of, you know, I'm not saying he was a troubled mind, but, you know, have you ever thought way back on something, God, I wish I would have never did that. Like, you just have to tell yourself, thank you, Jesus, and move on. But I'm not talking about resurrecting anything from the old way or any of that. But, you know, thoughts have their ways, don't they? Just trying to be. But the tongue, right? The tongue, the tongue, the tongue. You know, in verse 9, let's do, therewith we with God, even the Father, and therewith we curse we men which made after the similitude. He talks about, you know, the tongue, you know. We can bless God and we can curse people. And out of the same mouth proceeds the blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things shouldn't happen. Because if they happen, what happens to the Spring to the fountain. Okay? And verse 11, here's my verse. This is the one I gave Jesus credit for, which he really did say, but it was James who wrote it down. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Does a fountain send forth the same, at the same place sweet water and bitter water? Does a spring of water bubble out first with fresh water and then with bitter water? It cannot. Jesus said this. He said, can you get fig figs from a grapevine? Or can you get grapes from a fig tree? He, he basically used the same concept, right? The same principle. You cannot get bitter water and sweet water from the same fountain. Now, I'm pretty certain some people would say, well, wait a minute. If I can bless God on one hand and curse God on the other, well, then isn't it the same fountain? I mean, I'm a new creation man. But if we really take what he said as facts, can I use it like that? Facts that it cannot come out of the same fountain. What does that tell me then? It tells me what he wrote in another place, a double-minded heart person is unstable in all the ways. So what he's really trying to get you and I to understand You don't have one heart operating, you have two. Everybody say this with me, mixture. God doesn't like mixture, does he? Because mixture does what? 
according to Proverbs 25, verse 26, it corrupts. The old man, right, will cause you to compromise. And the minute we compromise, it corrupts. You ever, you ever, we, we kind of have this in our society, right? We do, right? You can do a bazillion good things, but it will only take one thing to change your image. <laughs> Only takes one, doesn't it? I think we used to say that say this at work when I was, you know, growing up. It was like, and they probably still do. It's like you can get like a hundred attaboys, but only mess up one time. Like right now, it doesn't matter, and it's been this way for a long time, but I, I told you this before. From an unbeliever's perspective, all Christians or church folks are exactly the same. But people in church know that's not really true. That's why even like, and the principle applies, like, well, that family over there, they're messed up. But it might only be one child. It might be only one parent. That church over there, it's messed up. So you can't have sweet water. Everybody say, I love sweet water. <laughs> it used to be smack water, Jack, but now it's sweet water. You can't have sweet water, right? Because Jack is out. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. I never thought about this, but anyway. Because God can talk to us in the where we live, right? But a fountain or a spring can't spring forth both good and bad. It just cannot. So that tells me there has to be duality. Now, I'm a firm believer and I will teach this. And I, if, if I had to have a fist fight over it, I would fight over it. But I don't fight. So, like, like I learned one thing from Jesus. This is what he said. He said, you know, I always used to, you know, quote this. It says, the blind follow the blind, they lead the blind, and they just fall in a ditch. But one day I was reading it a few years ago, I never ever read the beginning, or I never quoted the beginning of the verse. It says, leave them alone. So I don't fight. But if you've been circumcised in water baptism, cut off from the old nature, you cannot be doubled nature, but you can be double-minded. See, I wish it was automatic where I just got cut off and I, that new creation life just was. But because, like even Jesus, God came in flesh as a little baby, he still had to what? Grow in Strength in stature in spirit and in the natural realm. We have it in our physical lives. Well, what would make us not think that God would do it in the spiritual life? And what's really cool, because this will just mess you up, what's cool about spirit, spirit has no age. What God's trying to do is grow us up in the Spirit, through the Spirit, by the Spirit. It's for Him anyway. Am I making any sense? So you can't be double-natured, but you certainly can be double-minded. Now, the important part of all that is to be single-natured because without it, all you are doing is dressing up the old person. This is why a lot of church folks, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just stating facts here. It's judicial in this aspect, but my heart is tender toward it because I really do understand and know that no matter how good God is to anyone, even if they go to church every day of their life, if they never get cut off from Adam, they never can enter into what God is after. How do you know that? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the king dumb of God 
It's just simple. It's really elementary. Okay? So can a fountain, can a fountain spit out or bring out sweet water and bitter water? No, it cannot. So what is God after? He's after the heart. Give me your heart. Because remember this? In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, I think it was, I said, God says, I will, give me your heart. He said, I will circumcise it. Right? I will circumcise it for what reason? So that you and your children and your children's children or everybody that comes in this will do what? They'll love the Lord thy God with all their heart. And when they came to Jesus and they said to Jesus, what's the most important commandment? You know, I was reading that again last night and thinking about this. Like Jesus said, the first thing is, hear, O Israel. The Lord God is one Lord. And then he says, to love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might and all your strength. And then he says this again, this is the first commandment. I found it interesting that he said first and first, and then when he gave the one love one another was the second, that he actually gave three commands. Because the first one he said, Hear, O Israel. I say that was a command, not for the earthly realm. It was a command for the heavenly. It's kind of interesting there were no seconds on that one. Okay. How many lords? One. How many hearts will he fill up? One. I don't mean, look, like I get that there's, you know, how many people in here and each one has our own position, our own heart that he will live in, right? Right? But what he's really after is our, is our heart one for one Lord, right? Okay? Now turn with me. I think this is pretty good. And I don't have a lot of time now because I've talked. So, am I making any sense this morning? So far, this is where we, where we are. That the heart is the spring or the fountain. Now, I don't have time to get into all this, but you know where it says, if the I be single? Do you know what that word I means? Any time in, in, the, in the New Testament, well, I don't know, anytime. Most of the time in the New Testament, the word I literally means a fountain. And if the I be single, then the whole body is full of light. But if the I be wicked or double, your light, your fountain, your spring becomes dark or polluted, corrupted. See, this is what happened to the children of Israel when they were walking through the wilderness. That God just brought them through the rivers of baptism, the Red Sea. They got cut off from Pharaoh because he died in the water, didn't he? Remember, it killed everything. It was the whole picture what God was trying to get. And God began to feed them with heavenly food. They had manna. They had everything. And yet they were not satisfied with what God was giving them. They were only satisfied with what would make their flesh happy. Okay. All right. All right. Second Kings, chapter 2, verse 19. Now, you know the story when Elijah went up, right? And Elisha... He got the mantle, and he took the mantle, and he crossed the Jordan. He came back to this side, right? And he came, and then you remember the prophet said, Hey, uh, should we go look for him? He said, No, don't go look for him. And they went and looked. He goes, they bugged him until he said, Fine, if you want to go, just go. Right? And they went and looked, and they, they never found him, did, did they? Never found him. Right? So verse 18, and when they came again, or when they came back, right, 
to him, for he tarried, or he was, you know, he was at Jericho. And he said unto them, didn't I say don't go? But I wanted, what the most important part was, I wanted you to see where he was. He was at Jericho. Does anybody remember what Jericho means? Does anybody remember? No? Okay. We know what happened at Jericho, right? Like Joshua brought the army, they marched around and they fell down and everything. The walls came tumbling down, right? The, the reason was, was because God wanted open borders. No, never mind. I left. That was just a joke. <laughs> he really does want that. He really does. I don't mean physically for the country. I, I believe for your heart. He wants an open border. He wants the actions to flow out. He, you know, I know I could preach about he wants it fenced in or enclosed, right? In other words, gathered in his hand so that it can flow out. <laughs> this is what I love about God. If we get judicial or legalistic or unrealistic about it, we will miss him because it's about his spirit. Okay, so Jericho, it means fragrance, right? It's a, it also means moon. Okay, but it also gives us a picture, a biblical picture of there was unity there. Everybody knows this, right? The picture is, the moon is a picture of the church of the people, the consecrated ones. Is it not in this context that will create a fragrance because of the unity they have with God and one another? Where does that come out of? The heart. Are you all right? Verse 19, here we go. And the men of the city said unto Elijah, Elisha, I'm sorry, Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant. Now, if I had time, and maybe we will another day, but uh, remember, oh, geez, see, now I want, here's why I like to go to the verses, because I don't want to misquote them, but uh, remember, See, just stay right where you are. Don't move. I have to quote it now because it's, you know. Listen, a song and psalm uh, uh, for the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation. So what did the men of that city just say for Jericho? That it was a, it was a situational, it was... It was an ideal place. It was beautiful. It was pretty. It was, right? Is that not what they were saying? This is what they said, right? They, they said, the situation of this city is pleasant. As you can see, the church is good. Everybody say this. The church is good. Good bones. Good bones. I still like that show to some degree, you know, but it's like good bones. I really, you know, to be honest with you, I, Nathaniel can verify this. For the most part, I only watch two things on TV. It's transformational shows. Yeah, the drama's all in it, but it takes something that doesn't look like it could ever be any worth anything, and they turn it into something as uh, Puma, was that was his name, in The Lion King. So we're going to fight for this? He goes, it's a, surely it's a fixer-upper, isn't it? That was 1994. I like it because why? I have a vision. And God's really talking to me in a new dimension about this vision. Okay, here we go. He said, uh, the, he said Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, as you can see. But the water is not. And the ground is Barren. Can I say this? Liz, I, I want to read this in two other translations. I really want to get to my point, but I don't know if I am, because I'm going to quit pretty soon, because there's something really important here. Listen. The Living Bible. Now, a delegation of the city officials of Jer Jericho visited, and, it, and it's interesting it's Jericho, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, a delegation of the city officials of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem. Everybody say this. We have a problem. What do you think the problem is right now? Like if I ask you, what, what's your problem? 
Now, if you were honest with yourself, you could tell me some things. And if I said, what's the problem of this church? Or what's the problem with the church in general, the whole? The problem is exactly the same. What is the problem? The heart. It's the heart. And what is the problem of the heart? Sweet water and bitter water. No matter how hard we try. See, that's why I like Romans 7. When Paul said that the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I want to do, I don't. And he goes through the whole scenario. And oh, by the way, he talks about this, right? right? Like if a woman is married to a man and the man dies, she's free to marry another man. But if she marries someone while the old man is still alive, she is a what? An adulteress. But if he's dead. And he gets all the way down to the bottom. He said, oh, everybody say this with me. Oh, wretched man that I am. You can say girl too if you want. I'm an all-inclusive kind of guy. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. Now, right? We have a problem. We have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Houston. They told them, this city is located in the beautiful natural surroundings, as you can see. While well, the word is good, the people are good. God's moving in the midst, but we have a problem. What's the problem? But the water is bad. Now listen to this, listen to this. And causes our women to have miscarriages. I'll make it a little better for you. In the Message Bible. One day the men of the city said to Elijah, you can see for yourself, Master, how well our city is located. In other words, we're in the right place. But the water is polluted and nothing grows. The water is polluted. The water is bitter. The water cannot, it's not living, cannot produce life. It cannot. So therefore, the ground is barren. It's barren. It was barren because the water was bad. Now, I want to tell you something about Jericho. If you go over to Joshua, I think about chapter 26. The city of Jericho had a curse on it. Because this is what God had Joshua to prophesy. Look, whoever rebuilds this city, they're going to lose their firstborn and they're going to lose their lastborn. And a man from Bethel rebuilt the city under the leadership of Ahab the king. So the city had a curse. Now, by the way, the real problem that makes the word, I mean the water, bad is the traditions or the traditional way we think. I don't mean about doctrine, about the way we think in everyday life. We know how to turn it on and turn it off or 
do we do this? Maybe there's a better analogy. If there's two fountains, we redirect with a valve, depending on how we feel or think. I have no problem blowing my stack when I'm not getting my way. But when I want to get something, I know how to be really sweet. Everybody say this with me. There's good news. Good news. Right? Man-made traditions. I know that Jesus said this, that the traditions of men make the word of God not effective. But the real tradition is just the carnal way, which corrupts the spring or the fountain. It even corrupts. Look, look, listen, if the eye be single or if the fountain be single, look, it'll even corrupt the way you look at things. You have to see by the eye of the Spirit. Okay? And this has taken place where? In the city or in the church. Because it is corrupted. The word has been, look, it depends what you want, right? You can fly away like we just sang a song. There's no rapture, so don't be discouraged. Don't be blue, right? But look, God's not going to show up and make a kingdom on the earth either so that you can just live a long life doing what you want to do. As long as we remain in this text, in this mindset, what will the genealogy say when they're writing them down? They lived, they died, they lived, they died, they lived, they died, they lived, they died. And all of a sudden, there was one little group here Oh, like Jabez, and it was like an oak tree, but he died. You know, there's a song on the radio. It says, rise up. Rise up like Lazarus. But Lazarus died again. The word is bad. Rise up like Jesus, because Christ dieth no more. The only reason they'll pull, uh, make a song that says rise up Lazarus because of the mentality of the bad word or the bad water, it's getting people to go back to try and reproduce something that God has already moved through. God, what's, what's God's direction for you and I? To do what? Come high. Never to go back. Don't turn back. No man puts his hand to the plow looking back. Am I all right today? The water became corrupted because of the word in the city, right? It was all fouled up. It was muddied, wasn't it? By the sin of mixture. Two fountains in one. A double-mindedness. Sweet water and bitter water. God, I could preach for another hour because I have so many verses that I'm going to just leave you hanging and we'll talk about it, but I'll have to come back and share them because, you know, I, I have like four people that listen to me. So This mixture has produced barrenness, hasn't it? Nothing grows there. Miscarriages. What, you know, when we talk about miscarriage, right? Well, really, look, what are we trying to birth? A son. A man-child that has the full expression of Christ. I'm not talking about our little church here. I'm talking about the whole church in general that everybody looks at. Are you trying to get everybody changed? Yeah, I really am. Well, how do you go about doing it? By getting me changed, because I believe this with all my heart, that I've seen Jesus and he's changed me. You saw Jesus? Yeah, I certainly did. Now, if you're thinking I saw him physically, you, you, I, I have to help you out. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. I, saw, I don't see everything under our feet, but we see Jesus. He's the pattern, okay? Are you all right? 
But, you know, in this, like one of the things that's never been tro- too hard for me to do is to point out our problems, where the failures are. Let's just fix it. Okay? But I think there's something pretty cool here. The men of the city, they knew the water was bad. Do you think Elijah thought, or Elisha thought the water was bad? He, I don't know. I think he knew there was something better. Okay, here we go. Verse 20. And he said, bring me a what? A new cruise. Everybody say a new vessel, a new jar. Everybody say a new heart. And put salt in it. Now, the minute I read this, immediately my mind goes back to the sacrifices when he said, don't use leaven or honey because it won't give off a good fragrance. But in our mind, you know what? The sun is coming up over us. We're not revolving around it. Because my mind would say, honey, sweet, it's going to smell good. But he said, "Put do what with the sacrifice? To sprinkle it with salt. Do you remember that when we talked about that? Because it will give a sweet aroma. Well, how in the world can it give a sweet aroma? Salt? I would think honey. But I also re- always remember this, you know, because it's like, because salt, one of its qualities is to preserve things. And I remember saying that the sacrifice, the meat wasn't allowed to spoil in the midst of the fire. Therefore, it could stay intact, you and I, right, in the midst of the fire. Our salty lives, salted with from God, right, will keep us. Here we go. He said, put salt there in, without us being corrupted. No, no, did you hear it? So the, the fountain, the heart. He said, and he said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. Elisha wasn't worried about the problem. Elisha had the solution. And he went forth unto the spring, the heart, of waters. And he cast the salt. He didn't cast the vessel. He cast what was in the vessel. Now, I don't have time to go there this morning, but you can look it up and we can talk about it on Wednesday if you'd like. But look, it's all about the salt, the covenant of salt. Everybody say, God has a covenant of salt. What is a covenant? It's about a fellowship. It's about a communion. Where is the salt shaker? Usually we don't do it so much anymore because we've turned salt into being bad. But salt was always, when I was growing up, the salt and pepper shaker were always where? On the table. Where do you commune? Where's the family communion? We did away with the family dinner pretty much. Not everybody, but you get my point. Is because we have lives that are going in all kinds of directions, but like... It's at the table. This is why God uses the analogies. No matter what the era is, come sit at my table. Come eat at my table. You're going to have to change your ways, how you do things, if you want to eat with me. But this is what he said. He said, look, he said... Cast the salt, and he, oh, wait, wait, and he cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed the waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. Now, if you go and look, when the man from Bethel built Jericho again, his son died, the oldest and the youngest. Everybody say with this with me. There was still death in the land because of the curse. First and foremost, this is a picture. Elisha is a picture. He's the forerunner, Jesus. 
He was the one that was cast into the bitter waters of humanity, into our hearts, to do away with the what? The curse. See, we have to also understand this. When the oldest son died and the youngest son died at Jericho, that was the curse. Everyone, look, the firstborn, Jesus, he was what? Killed on a tree. Anyone that hangeth on a tree is cursed, right? Isn't that what it says? Guess who the last son is? You and I. We have to die to self. Pick up your cross and follow me so that you can be the salt of the earth so that your fountain can't be bitter. One last verse and I'm done and I'm going to come back to this. I have so much more to talk about that. Oh my God, I don't have time right now. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. Back to Colossians. I don't know. Colossians. I'm really sorry about this. I could keep preaching, but... Can I read this in Colossians 3 first? But, but no, I'm going to Colossians 4. Colossians 3. Above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, completeness, all right? And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. Now listen, verse 6. You ready? Let your speech, conversation, behavior, what flows out of you, your actions, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. God never wanted us to be salty. He wanted us to be preservation. Savor to give, like you put a little, you know, like you, you know, when I'm I, I only put, sprinkle salt on one thing, I love salt and guacamole. Don't ask me why, but I love it, it just enhances the flavor. Everybody, say this with me God wants my speech to be enhanced with flavor. Why? Because the bitter waters of humanity need to be healed from the curse. Jesus became a curse so that you and I could be delivered from the curse. But it takes two things in the earth to establish a thing. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every person let your conversation be gracious as well as sensible for then you will have the right answer for everyone this is what God is after in our lives going all the way back to the beginning you can stand up going all the way back to the beginning what did he say a righteous man falling down before the wicked causes the fountain or the spring to be polluted or corrupted. But keep your heart diligently, for out of it, the heart, springs forth the issues, the actions of our lives. Because there is a curse now I want to rephrase it just a little bit because like people will get religious and they'll just go from a certain position but everybody say this with me there's two laws alive right now the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death is still active and what needs to happen is a people a son a man-child, to change the waters in the garment. 
season it with salt. But you and I can't have that mixture in our lives and have an expectation. You know, I know nobody ever listens to us, Kaylee. Bitter water and sweet water in the same vessel. Do you know why when Jesus showed up to the woman at the well and he said to her, if you would have known who I was, you would have asked me for a drink. Because he only had one kind of heart. Only one way to talk. Only one fountain could come out of him. In so much so, no matter what she had in her life going on. See, this is what we would do. We'd compromise for the lady, fall down before the wicked. Jesus only let the sweet water issues of life spring out of him. That changed the whole world. Here's the good news. He cast it into us so that we can become like him. Keep our heart diligently. Retain. Let it be retained in our own hearts. What's the one thing God wants more than anything in your life? Your heart. You can have a sickness, a disease, all kinds of things. They'll tell you cancer kills you. It really doesn't. I mean, technically. Your heart stops beating. Which, by the way, is still the number one killer or disease in the whole globe. Not just the United States, the whole globe. Give him a heart. See, one of the things I learned about when I had AFib was this. You can have a beating heart, but it could be beating at your own pace. And you're not in step with what he's doing. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, God, that you have come to us with your grace and your mercy. It truly is, God, this word is truly liberating. It's a celebration that you have come into our hearts whereby we cry, Abba, Father, so that you can, as we yield, cut away the old so that we can become the fullness of that new creation, man. Everybody says, amen. This is why God is really after it. You know what God wants church to be? A heart that just speaks who he is, celebrates him. That's it. Amen and amen.